have uh, an excellent speaker. Uh, my name, for those of you who don't know me, is uh, Lisa Zarsky. I'm a professor here in the International Environmental Policy Program. And one of the courses I teach is called Governing the Global mm -hmm. Commons, which is focused largely, no, not completely, on the emerging uh, climate governance system at the international level. And we've been talking quite a bit about uh, the Paris Agreement, the target, the 1.5 target um, to, uh, for uh, climate stabilization, um, what that's going to entail. We've been looking at nationally determined contributions from all the countries of the world. And um, it's pretty clear that um, it's really got to be all shoulders to the wheel to uh, achieve the climate stabilization target. And it's also clear that mitigation, no matter how uh, determined and passionate and ambitious, will probably not get us there. We'll need to do some carbon dioxide removal or net negative emissions. And so for that, to, to uh, help us understand that, what the technologies are, what the issues are, what the governance issues are, what the pros and cons are, I brought to Middlebury really one of the world's leading experts uh, in this area. And that's Professor Will Burns here. Why don't we just say, hey, Will. <laughs> but I will tell you something about it. Will is the co-director of the Institute for Carbon Removal Law and Policy at American University. He's already spent how many years on this issue? A lot. <laughs> and uh, including uh, issues of geoengineering, which we're not planning to talk about today, but if you have questions about it, please hold those and do those afterwards. Um, so without further ado, uh, please w welcome Will Burns. very much to get this all set up. All right, thank you everyone. Uh, some of you I know have to be here, some of you came on your own accord, so thank you everyone for coming, period. Um, I used to teach here at one time, so I have a great affection for, uh, for what was the Monterey Institute, now the Middlebury Institute, and so um, we're going to talk about um, carbon dioxide removal options today. So I want to start off by talking about the Paris Agreement, right? I know those of you that are in class have talked a lot about Paris, but for those of you that aren't, like this is the long-term international agreement, right, to seek to uh, uh, ensure that we do not pass critical climactic thresholds uh, through the course of this century and beyond. And at the very heart of the Paris Agreement were these temperature objectives that were established for the first time at the international level, which called on the world community to hold temperatures to, quote, well below 2 degrees Celsius, about 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit, and at least aspirationally try to hold temperatures to below 1.5 degrees Celsius, right? Paris entered into force in 2016, and uh, virtually every nation in the world is part of Paris, including us, though maybe for not, not for the law, okay? Um, unfortunately, um, if you look at the pledges that have been made by countries uh, under Paris, the so-called nationally determined contributions, and that's the way Paris works. It's called a, a top, uh, a bottom-up agreement where the countries make pledges to reduce their emissions, and we hope that it correlates with what is necessary to reduce emissions to hold temperatures to where Paris was established. If you look at the pledges that were made and what actually needs to be done to meet the temperature objectives of Paris, there is a yawning gap. Okay? Indeed, instead of holding temperatures to well below 2 degrees Celsius by the end of the century, according to recent studies, we are on track to ha have temperature increases of somewhere between 3.2 and 3.7 degrees Celsius by the end of the century. And because of the, even after we've decarbonized the world economy, uh, there will be continued increases of temperatures for hundreds of years thereafter, okay? Now, temperature increases of three degrees Celsius or more are potentially catastrophic in terms of human institutions and in terms of ecosystems. For example, if temperatures increase by three degrees Celsius, it will assuredly melt the Greenland ice sheet. That ice sheet alone ensures that sea level rises by about seven meters or 20 feet, okay? Good news is it takes a while. The bad news is, is that it is permanent in the sense that it would be a thousand or more years before sea level begins to decline. And that's just one ice mass. Three degree increase in temperature by the end of the century, according to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, 
uh, would likely imperil the existence of somewhere between 40 and 60 percent of the species on Earth. If you look at the world's oceans, for example, a three degrees Celsius increase in temperatures is likely to wipe out all of the world's coral reefs, which are responsible for providing sustenance for at least 20% uh, of oceanic based species. If temperatures increase by three degrees Celsius, it's likely we will see massive declines in crops, especially in some of the most vulnerable places of the world, such as Sub-Saharan Africa and parts of South America. So as a consequence of this sobering reality, the disconnect between what the world community must do in terms of climate change and what the world community appears willing to do at this point, we've begun to look at a suite of technologies that fall under a general rubric of what we call carbon dioxide removal options. Okay? So we're going to start off with a working definition and then we'll drill down to specific technologies uh, as, as we move on in this presentation. So CDR, or carbon dioxide removal, are options that aim to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and sequester, or meaning store it, or utilize it, directly uh, countering the greenhouse effect that causes uh, climate change. Okay? So, as I've said, um, there's been a number of, of studies recently that have acknowledged the need for carbon dioxide removal, given where we are and where we're likely to be through this century and beyond. For example, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the primary international scientific body that assesses climate change, in its latest report, its fifth assessment report, uh, ran models, they're called integrated assessment models, and they run scenarios to find ways that we can hold temperatures to certain levels. Of the thousands of models that they ran that fed in things such as reducing economic growth, reducing population, massive increases in renewables, of all of those scenarios, uh, thousands of scenarios, there were only 204 of them that were actually able to hold temperatures to below 2 degrees Celsius. And of those 204, 187 of them contemplated large-scale deployment of carbon dioxide removal. Okay? Now that's one of the sobering things. We're talking about technologies that are largely in their infancy, but the, the primary scientific body now tells us that they, that they are critical for us to meet the objectives of the Paris Agreement, and at very large scale. Those studies indicate that we would probably have to store somewhere between 15 and 20 gigatons, that's a billion tons, of carbon dioxide annually to meet the two degrees Celsius threshold. Moreover, and the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change in its most recent assessment of, of the Paris Agreement, which was called the 1.5C study, which was released last year, also concluded, as it said, uh, there's almost no cases that have been identified that help us meet the 1.5C degree uh, threshold without large-scale use of this technology. Okay? And then finally, even if we exceed 2 degrees Celsius, it's contemplated in these so-called overshoot scenarios that we're going to want to try to bring temp uh, uh, atmospheric levels of carbon dioxide back down to try to bring temperatures back down. And again, it's contemplated that carbon dioxide removal may be one of the ways to do it. Okay? So given the looming importance of a technology that largely does not exist at this point, it's important to uh, discuss as, as citizens and as scholars what role CDR may have, what some of the risks and benefits are, and how we might regulate these technologies in the future. And so that's exactly what we're going to look at. We're going to look at two major things. First of all, we're going to look at some specific carbon dioxide removal, or NETS, negative emissions technologies is the other term for this, uh, that have been discussed to date and where they are in terms of their stage of development and their potential risks and their potential benefits, okay, and costs, okay. And then second of all, after that, um, uh, we're going to talk about governance options at the international level. Okay? If we decide to go down this path, what international institutions may already have sought to regulate carbon dioxide removal options? What other institutions might play a role? What are some of the issues associated with effective governance of these options, at, the, at least at the international level? Okay? All right. So let's start off by talking about uh, some of these carbon dioxide removal options. And we're going to start <coughs> off with this one called uh, BECS. Bioenergy with carbon capture and storage. And the primary reason that we talk about, uh, about BECS 
is that if you look at the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change study that ran all those models, right, and said we need carbon dioxide removal, the carbon dioxide removal technology that they overwhelmingly discussed was BEX, okay? Now that was a couple years ago. Now we're starting to talk of some others, but given the central importance of BEX in that discussion, we start off with BEX, okay? So BEX involves the production of energy through the use of, of bio uh, feedstocks, right? This can be anything such as dedicated energy crops that can be used to produce fuels, can be used to produce heat, used to produce electricity. Uh, it could be uh, trees, uh, it could be uh, crop residues, uh, it could be chips off of trees that are not utilized, uh, it can be uh, industrial waste, okay? Anything that, that provides biomass feedstock. Now, that biomass feedstock is then uh, combusted, right, to produce energy. And then what we seek to do is capture the carbon dioxide that's produced in the flue gas when we combust that bioenergy, and uh, then subject it to a process that compresses that carbon dioxide into a liquid form, okay? And then that liquid carbon dioxide can be transported, for example, utilizing pipelines or, 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 or trains or trucks, uh, to be stored, right, and can be stored underground in things such as saline aquifers, abandoned coal mines, uh, et, et cetera, or it can be stored in the world's oceans, or it can be utilized, right? And the utilization process could be things such as production of chemicals, potential use in things such as carbonated beverages, or to produce energy in some cases, okay? So that's bioenergy and, and carbon capture uh, as, as a process. Okay. Um, as I said, uh, BEX is an extremely important uh, potential has an extremely important potential role, and some studies have indicated that BEX potentially could be used to store somewhere between 10 and 15 gigatons or billion tons of carbon dioxide annually, right through this process. Uh, however, there are many challenges associated with this technology. Okay, um, first of them is cost. Okay. At this point, uh, the cost of capturing a ton of carbon dioxide utilizing BEX is somewhere between $135 and $175 per ton. Okay? And that's extremely problematic, right? Because if you look at the cost of carbon in the world community in terms of regulations, we're really nowhere near that. The European Union, which does a far better job than the United States in this context, has a cost of carbon in its European Union emissions trading system of somewhere between $25 and $30 per ton, right? So it's not sufficient to drive incentives for industry to utilize this technology at this point. The United States, of course, has no real cost on carbon, and the Trump administration has even argued that the cost should be negative, right? So it's difficult to see how this gets driven, at least in the shorter term. Okay? Now, in the longer term, uh, cost of carbon will increase and adoption potentially happens. But that could take quite a bit of time, right? So cost is a major issue. And bringing costs down, of course, may happen through economies of scale uh, and, and learning by doing, et cetera. Uh, but it's still speculative in terms of how much it will come down. Second problem uh, associated with, uh, uh, with this uh, uh, technology uh, is, uh, is, is social justice issues, right? And these are perhaps even more important. First of all, it is likely that if you were going to utilize BEX at a very large scale, if you were sequestering somewhere between 10 and 15 gigatons, you would need huge amounts of land. And a lot of that land would probably be, have to be diversion of agricultural areas. Okay. One recent study said that if you were to do this at a scale of 10 gigatons, you would probably need as much land as 2.5 times the size of India. Okay. It's likely that a very large amount of that would be agricultural croplands that would be diverted uh, to uh, dedicated energy crops. If one were to do that, it's likely that you would see substantial increases in agricultural prices, which could severely impact the world's most vulnerable. One recent study indicated that even at three gigatons, BEX could potentially increase food prices for the world's uh, poorest people by somewhere between 30 and 40 percent, right? So potentially catastrophic in terms of that uh, implication. Now proponents of BEX argue a, a couple of things. First of all, they say we could use other things other than dedicated energy uh, crops. For example, crop residues. The problem with crop residues 
is first of all, uh, it's likely that that's a small part of, of the feedstocks that you would need to use bats at this kind of scale. And second of all, crop residues are often uh, actually applied back into the soils to, to ensure agricultural productivity in the long term. So if you remove those re, uh, uh, residues, you likely decrease crop yields, which means you're going to have to grow more crops, which is also going to have greenhouse gas implications, right? Some people say instead of using land, uh, we, can, we can move to a blue uh, carbon economy and utilize things such as algae, right? problem with that is beyond uh, some serious environmental issues of doing this at large scale, it's at this point extremely costly, extremely costly, has very high energy costs also, and doesn't seem to be viable, at least in the short term. Okay? So that's one problem, is, is, is food production. Another problem is water. A BEX process at scale requires very large amounts of water. Okay? Whether it's for growing uh, the, uh, the feedstocks themselves or the process of, of sequestration and, and, and so forth. One recent study said that BEX at large scale would likely require as much water as all the water that we currently use for irrigation on Earth. Okay? That's problematic, right? Yeah, fair enough. Um, so, uh, uh, water remains a, a, a major issue in this context. And the last is biodiversity impacts. If you're diverting large amounts of forest, if you're diverting, uh, converting prairie grasslands, for example, to dedicated energy crops or trees, et cetera, um, you, can, you can have little losses of ecosystems. One recent study said that at large scale, BEX could potentially have as much ecosystem impact as 2.8 degrees uh, of temperature increase, right? So you're virtually where you would be anyway, uh, and you get all of the other potential uh, harms, okay? So um, uh, that's, uh, that's BEX, okay? Well, can I just say, yeah. I get that you, uh, in the sequestration side, but on the utilization side, don't you end up releasing the CO2 into the atmosphere? Well, it depends. In the utilization side, it becomes tricky because you have to do a life cycle assessment with that, right? Mm -hmm. If you're utilizing uh, uh, BEX, for example, to produce uh, uh, materials, like, for example, one of the things they talk about utilizing CO2 for is plastics production, right? You can divert it all to plastics production, be a high-strength material. But a lot of those plastics, of course, ultimately end up in the waste stream very quickly, and the CO2 is released again, right? So you're not likely to get long-term sequestration. It depends on what you're utilizing it for. Now, some of the companies are now talking about utilizing the CO2 ultimately in a, in a closed-loop sort of hydrogen energy economy, right? And if that were to happen, uh, potentially get a, a, a better uh, throughput from this. But that, again, is extremely costly, right? And probably not, not happening anytime soon. Yeah? I am lost. I thought that we are trying to remove the carbon dioxide from the air, the environment. I didn't realize we want to convert the uh, biomass into the carbon to, in order to store it. Right. Well, well, the idea is, is that it, you're going to need to produce energy, right? Okay, one way or another. You're either going to burn, you're, you're going to use renewables, or if you're not doing that, you're going to burn coal or, oh. or oil or something like that, and, and that produces, and it produces carbon dioxide. This also produces carbon dioxide, but the reason that it's potentially more beneficial is, first of all, the biomass itself stores carbon dioxide, unlike coal or oil, and then you store the uh, CO2 that's released in the combustion process, right? And that's why, in theory, you get a net decrease in, in atmospheric levels of carbon dioxide. Whereas if you burn coal, it's, it's just the CO2. So this is one of the alternatives in order to produce energy that we, we need. Correct. Well, it could, be, it could be a way that you could produce energy, okay, instead of, for example, fossil fuels, that potentially decreases the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere because the biomass uh, stores CO2, right? Uses it in photosynthesis, right? Trees, plants, etc. And then when you burn the biomass, you not only store the CO2, but of course you're planting more biomass, right? For for the, for you know the next uh, this uh, process, and that biomass is storing CO2, right? Whereas if you're burning coal, it's just a net release. CO2 comes down. That's where, that's where it captures it from the air. Yeah, in the, so it's a photosynthetic process. And then it just, in theory, you just keep 
um, uh, reproducing the feedstock, right? You cut the trees down or the crops, you plant more crops, it stores CO2, then you capture the CO2 on the other end and you either utilize it or you, or you store it, right? Yeah? I'm concerned, how much of this is kind of an accounting trick? Because uh, the economic ledgers are very different from the chemical ledgers here, and I'm not entirely convinced there's a net negative at best. This seems neutral, um, based on my understanding of chemistry. Right. In theory, it's supposed to be net negative in the through the sequestration process, right? The 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 growing of the CO2 and the sequestering of the CO2 makes it neutral if one then buries it, and then the subsequent growing of additional biofeedstock creates the negative effect. That's the argument that's made. Isn't the energy cost of compressing it and storing it on the ground? Come closer to what he says. It's yes. going to there, be more there's a there there is a there is a definite energy cost associated with this process, and that's part of what the the calculations are, right? What they say at the end is there's still a net negative uh, that occurs through this process. Now, what it means is, as is true with there's some of these systems that are just called carbon capture and sequestration, and they utilize them with like coal plants, right? So you're burning coal, and then you capture the the, the carbon, right? Um, the energy penalty with that is about 30%, right? So for every three plants that you would use the CCS for, you need a fourth plant to provide the energy for the CCS, right? So it's, uh, uh, it only works at very large scale to end up net negative, and it only ends up net negative if you assume additional planting of, 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 of bioenergy feedstocks and, and how, how quickly those, those feedstocks grow and start sequestering carbon. Given the growth of the population, planting, taking arable land to, to just burn it is not going to be cold. Or but, well, <laughs> it is. It is. Uh, it, it, I, I, I submit it just for for your consideration in that context. That's certainly been one of the, the, the discussions. Okay. Okay. Anybody else on board with this? Okay. So, um, a second one that's being discussed um, uh, as we've moved from more skepticism about facts, right, in terms of all of these kinds of consideration, cost, energy use, potential impacts on ecosystems, uh, we are increasingly talking about uh, a portfolio approach, right, where we may be utilizing facts at a much lower scale, right, uh, to, to meet our sustainability concerns, but that means that we need to supplement that with other sort of options, and so a number of options are being discussed. Okay, so I want to talk what what a bunch of those are at this point. Okay, so one um, is is afforestation and reforestation, right? This is uh, this is uh, one of what we call the natural carbon solutions, right? It's uh, uh, growing trees uh, in areas in which they have not existed for at least 50 years. That's the standard international definition of afforestation, or growing trees where they existed before, right, and have been felled for whatever reason to increase uh, intake of, of carbon dioxide, okay? Um, and that's certainly being discussed in a number of quarters. Um, one of the things that is, uh, is striking about, uh, about afforestation and, uh, and reforestation is that um, the numbers of what, of uh, the amount of sequestration that could be effectuated are all over the board. Right? Uh, there's all kinds of assumptions about how much area could actually be used for, for afforestation and reforestation processes, how permanent it is, how much CO2 would be taken in. And as a consequence, some, some studies say that even at very large scale, we might sequester maybe a gigaton of carbon dioxide annually, whereas some other studies say that we could potentially get a third of all of the carbon dioxide sequestration that we want to do through forests. Right? So that's something, that characterization is, is something that we're still uh, in early stages, even though this is obviously something that's been talked about uh, uh, for a long time. There's also a lot of uh, challenges and, and, and social justice considerations in this context. Okay? One is the potential threat that in, in many areas, people will simply be thrown off of their land to create monocultural plantations to suck up carbon to give benefits for elites, right? And we've already seen this in the context of the clean development mechanism under the, the Kyoto Protocol, right? And so there's concerns about that. 
uh, in context of REM, which is another program in the climate agreements to provide credits for reducing deforestation, um, we've seen some evidence that this would happen. And so we're, we're concerned about that. A second issue is that you have to be very careful from a scientific standpoint where the trees are planted if you're actually going to get a benefit in terms of climate change. The reason is, is that if you plant trees in the northern hemisphere, okay, in areas that were uh, heretofore highly reflective land masses, such as scrublands, okay, uh, when you have areas like that, they have what we call high surface albedo, meaning they reflect most of the incoming radiation back to space, and that exerts a cooling impact. By contrast, when you plant trees, they become a much darker surface, they absorb a lot more of the incoming radiation, and some recent studies have said that by doing so, in the northern hemisphere, if you plant trees, you might actually negate all of the benefits of, of the carbon sequestration, or you might even get a net increase in warming. Okay, so from a scientific perspective, um, we need more characterization of where uh, we can do this and get the benefits and what the actual benefits are, right? And we, we haven't done uh, a, a lot of that to date, okay? Uh, speaking of uh, monoculture, do you think if we switch from monoculture to conservation agriculture, that we're gonna like uh, absorb more CO2? Is that gonna be effective if we make it uh, US-wide? Uh, no. uh, from monoculture to conservation agriculture. <coughs> conservation agriculture, you know, is a technique? Yeah. Uh, there's, there's plenty of studies that indicate that a, a number of conservation agricultural things, such as agroforestry, for example, could potentially have, have it, it very high benefits in terms of carbon sequestration. But again, even with agroforestry, it, it matters where you do it. Right, because if you're reducing surface albedo again, it's not necessarily a net benefit. Sure. Right, so there's a lot more to be done. Is um, it? I think in that aspect, it's more of like a take your poison situation because monocultures really affect soil quality and contri contribute to um, degradation from agricultural systems. So that, I guess that, that it's a little um, puzzling to me that it's a recommendation in order to create, to um, for our carbon sequestration, where it creates m other environmental issues. Well, we do that all the time. Yeah. Uh, uh, just start off with a catalytic converter in your car, right? Um, the catalytic converter in your car was created to reduce air pollution, and it resulted because of the release of toxics and substantial increases in water pollution, right? We have these consequences all the time. The other thing is, is that what we, we usually are doing is we're doing cost-benefit analysis. We're trying to determine if on balance this is better off. And then we're also engaged in comparative risk assessment, right? We're saying, well, if there's this solution with costs and benefits and there's an alternative, which one makes the most sense or how do we integrate them and at what scale to optimize the benefits over the risks, right? And it's, it's, it's very difficult. And, um, and in this field, um, you know, as I, as I emphasized already, and we'll see even more so, um, it, it's, it's, it remains a bit speculative, right? There's always going to be um, risks associated with these approaches. But the thing to emphasize also uh, is there's also risks with business as usual, obviously, in terms of climate change, right? So um, one has to be looking at these, one has to be looking at the alternatives, massive increase in, in renewables, right? And, and what, what the benefit of doing that is, whether that's viable, how we integrate um, all of those approaches to try to address climate change is, is the way we have to do it. But yeah, it, 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 there's almost no approach you take that's a free lunch, right? Um, there's a study a couple days ago that said that if you're going to uh, uh, decarbonize the world economy through renewables, the amount of rare earth materials that will be extracted will create massive toxic impacts in many countries, right? Mm -hmm. There's no, there's no free lunch, right? And we as a society have to try to minimize those impacts, uh, but also acknowledge that those impacts will occur no matter what, because we've gotten ourselves in a situation where we're so screwed in terms of climate change that we have to respond, and we have to respond massively and quickly. So it's a matter really of the least bad of all the bad solutions. To some degree. Right, or, or, or it certainly says that we have reached a point where there uh, are no 
alternatives that don't produce both risks and also produce some some negative impacts, mm -hmm. right? There's just none, right? Um, the goal obviously is to try to try to minimize those benefits, uh, get the greatest benefits that we can. Also looking at co-benefits, obviously, with some of these things, right? If you're developing renewables, you're getting co-benefits in terms of jobs, in terms of revenue, et cetera. Um, if you're doing some of these agricultural things, you're getting co-benefits in terms of, you know, soil water retention, agricultural yields, et cetera. Um, how, do, how do we optimize that? But we, we acknowledge you, you can't, in my opinion, you can't ever say, well, we shouldn't do that because it's got some, uh, some be disbenefits or because then you do nothing. And the disbenefit of climate change, the one thing we are certain about is catastrophic. Right. Mm -hmm. Who coined that term, disbenefit? <laughs> That's the most politically ridiculous thing I've ever <laughs> I don't know. You'll have to look for it. Okay. So... Um, the third one that we uh, that we talk about uh, is uh, is something called uh, ocean iron fertilization. Now we're moving to the ocean. Okay. Ocean iron fertilization is uh, the, one of the few approaches uh, that we're talking about where we've actually done uh, a fair amount of field research. Okay, um, so when it comes to BACs, we've got a few demonstration plants. Um, we've we've had a history of growing forests. Uh, but a lot of these other things, we've done virtually nothing but look at them in the lab. But ocean iron fertilization, we've, we've done more with. And so it's an interesting one to look at. And it's also a cautionary tale, right, in terms of what may happen in this context. So the essence of understanding uh, ocean iron fertilization uh, is to understand the role of phytoplankton, right, the microscopic plants that we find on land and also find in the world's oceans, um, and their role in sequestering carbon, right? So as we know, uh, phytoplankton sequester carbon uh, just as is true in land and use it in photosynthetic processes, right? For growth, reproduction, etc. Indeed, about half of all of the carbon dioxide on Earth is stored in phytoplankton. Okay? It's a natural process. Now, when uh, uh, this uh, phytoplankton take up carbon dioxide, virtually all of that carbon dioxide is almost immediately released back at surface and ends up back in the world's atmosphere almost immediately. Okay? But there is a small percentage of the CO2 that will die with the organism, and it will drop to the bottom of the ocean. Okay? And when that happens, the CO2 uh, in that organism can end up stored in deep oceanic sediments for potentially 400 to 500 years. Okay? And that's what we call the biological pump. Okay? That naturally occurs, and it takes some CO2 um, out of the atmosphere. Okay? So, proponents of ocean iron fertilization have said if we could increase, massively increase, phytoplankton production, we could get a lot more uptake of carbon dioxide and we could supercharge this biological pump and take a lot of CO2 out of the atmosphere. Okay? That's the idea behind ocean iron fertilization. The reason it's called ocean iron fertilization is that the theory is, is that when it comes to optimal production of phytoplankton, there's enough of critical macronutrients, that being phosphorus and nitrogen, but there's a shortage of a critical micronutrient, and that micronutrient is iron. Okay? So proponents of ocean iron fertilization say, if we look at the world's oceans, about 20% of them, primarily uh, in, the, uh, in the Southern Ocean, nearly Antarctica, um, are, have a shortage of iron. And so what we should do is seed those areas with iron to substantially increase phytoplankton production, okay? So, a couple of questions associated with that. One, uh, will that be effective? And two, is it a good idea to put lots of iron in sensitive ocean ecosystems? So the first question is, will it be effective? Well, some of the early studies in this context, and again, these were all laboratory-based, said, yeah, this could be extremely effective. Some of the early studies said we might be able to sequester as much as 25% of all of the of, uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere uh, by, uh, by utilizing this process. Okay? However, as we've gone out and actually done field research, and we've seeded small patches of the world's oceans with phytoplankton, the results have become increasingly disappointing. Okay? Um, and this is why. Okay? What we found out is that 
uh, when we've uh, seeded these areas, almost <coughs> always we've got large profusions of phytoplankton. So it's done exactly what people thought at the outset, right? Get a lot more phytoplankton. And we've actually seen CO2 levels uh, declining in those small areas as a result. However, the only way that you get the biological pump to work uh, is if those species die before they get consumed by zooplankton. The zooplankton eat them, the CO2 gets released, it's immediately released at surface again. And what we found is that there's substantial loss of CO2 in that process, okay? As a consequence, the studies that have been done more recently say that instead of being able to sequester as much as 25% of all of the CO2, it's likely that we could only sequester maybe 5%, maybe 3% of all of the CO2, right? So the numbers have gone down uh, substantially during this time, okay? Proponents, on the other hand, argue that we need to do additional research, we need to do longer term research uh, to, uh, to determine if this could be done, or even if it only ended up being three to five percent, it could again be part of this portfolio, okay? That's the argument that's made. The other uh, issue uh, that we talked about is, uh, is whether uh, it's a good idea to dump large amounts of iron into the oceans, right? And there's a number of reasons to believe that it's not, okay? The first of these um, is in terms of the assemblage of phytoplankton that are produced, when you put iron into these ecosystems, okay? It's not like Macy's. You don't get to go and pick and choose what you want, right? And you get the kind of phytoplankton you get when you put the iron in. And one of the fears that ocean biologists have is that we would create massive profusions of phytoplankton species that are not palatable to zooplankton species in the area. And as a consequence, we get a biological uh, uh, cascade, right, where the decline in, uh, in zooplankton results in decline of species that in turn feed on the zooplankton and so on and so forth, okay? And indeed, we have some empirical evidence of this. There was one experiment in the <coughs> Indian Ocean that produced a massive profusion of one kind of phytoplankton called Phyocystis antarctica. Okay. Good news was it produced a lot of that, right? The bad news was the zooplankton wouldn't eat it. Okay. So if that were to have been done at a very large scale, it potentially would have catastrophic implications for an ecosystem and potentially irreversible implications for the ecosystem. Okay. So that's one fear that we have uh, associated with this. Um, another thing that we worry about are toxic algae blooms, right? We see these all over the world in places like the Mediterranean, the Black Sea, for example, with massive declines of marine mammals as a consequence. Uh, again, uh, creating these large profusions of phytoplankton and not being able to predict what kind of phytoplankton you get could result in those kind of, of, of declines. And, and we just don't know at this point. Um, the last thing is that paradoxically, as was true, true with trees, is that uh, this could actually increase uh, global warming, okay? The reason is, is that when uh, uh, phytoplankton die, right, they take up lots of oxygen in that process and they can create anoxic environments. And anoxic environments result in the production of two other things, which are methane and nitrous oxides. Right? And as you know, methane uh, is a much more potent uh, greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. It has what we call a global warming potential of 24, meaning that every molecule of methane traps 24 times much, as much, uh, has 24 times as much heat producing properties as one molecule of carbon dioxide. Nitrous oxides are over 300 times, right? And so some studies say that if uh, you were to produce enough methane and nitrous oxides from this process, it could offset all of the benefits or even result in that increase in warming, okay? So um, proponents argue that we need to, uh, again, conduct additional research to try to make this assessment, but um, uh, it, it, it's, it's unclear when that will happen, okay? All right, so uh, the next one, and this one has been a lot in the news this week, uh, is called uh, direct air capture, okay? This is how direct air capture works. So ambient air, right, um, is then either forced through using some kind of process or just, or just naturally uh, uh, filters through these systems here. These lovely things over here we call artificial trees. Right? And so the idea would be to construct them 
they have filters on the top, okay? Or these, these systems here, which are modular units about the size of a box cover, okay? Also have filters in them. The ambient air enters the filters. The carbon dioxide is separated out from the other constituent elements of the ambient air. And again, subjected to pressure, liquid, put in liquid form, and then shipped or utilized, much like the CCS process, okay? The difference between this and that carbon capture process is that you're not capturing carbon from combusting uh, 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 energy materials, but you're getting it from the air <coughs> itself, okay? Direct air capture. Proponents of direct air capture argue that you could potentially remove enough carbon dioxide from the atmosphere by, by utilizing these units to return temperatures back to pre-industrial levels, if you, if you actually want to do that, or keep temperatures, keep atmospheric uh, concentrations where they are now. Okay? Now, challenges in, and uh, associated with this process are, are many, okay? Um, one of them is cost, okay? Um, a couple of years ago, the American Physics Society said that the cost of capturing one ton of CO2 through this process was somewhere between $600 and $1,000 per ton, okay? Well, that's obviously not gonna work, right? Um, but um, we, we've had some dramatic breakthroughs in the last couple of years. Um, just a couple of days ago, uh, there was an announcement that a company in Ireland uh, was, uh, with, had established a partnership with a, with a research team at Arizona State uh, who are now developing a pilot plant for direct air capture that they believe could bring the price down to somewhere between $95 and $97 per ton, right? Then it becomes, starts to look viable. There's a company in Canada that, uh, that uh, headed up by a Harvard physics professor that also just had a huge infusion of cash, somewhere between 50 and 60 million dollars, uh, who also said that they also have a process that's below hundred dollars. There's a company in Switzerland uh, that's made similar uh, 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 um, uh, claims, okay? So uh, cost could be a major factor because again, one thing one has to be cautious of is, is what people are saying can be done at the pilot level and what could be done in terms of large scale uh, production, right? So the jury remains out, but at least there's some hope that this might be cheaper uh, than we originally uh, thought it was. Um, another major challenge though uh, is, uh, is potential resistance uh, to, uh, to storing the CO2, okay? And this is something uh, that, uh, that is uh, relevant also to, to bioenergy and carbon capture, right? Uh, if you're not gonna utilize the CO2, right? And a lot of people believe it's gonna be too costly or you're not gonna be able to utilize very much you're going to have to be putting 15 or 20 billion tons of carbon under the ground. You're also gonna to have to be shipping it through communities, okay? And a lot of people believe that there will be substantial community resistance to doing this, okay? You've all heard of NIMBY, not in, uh, not in my backyard. People call this NUMBY, not under my backyard, right? <laughs> people believe that, uh, that, people believe that, that, that carbon dioxide is going to leak, that it potentially has toxic implications, uh, they're not going to want it uh, being transported either. And in the Netherlands and Germany, right, two places that arguably care a lot more about climate change than us, when they establish pilot plants for carbon capture and sequestration, um, those plants were shut down, the pilot plants, because of citizen resistance, mm -hmm. right? So it's likely in the United States that that would substantially <coughs> increase the cost of these, of these things because you're going to have to have litigation or potentially could shut down these processes, especially if you're going to utilize it at a very uh, large scale, as we were talking about, okay? So that's, uh, that's a couple of issues associated with uh, uh, direct air capture. Um, okay, another what we call natural carbon uh, solution that is being talked about is something called uh, biochar and uh, soil uh, 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 sequestration, soil carbon sequestration. Okay, so let's start off with, uh, with the, uh, uh, the biochar uh, process. So biochar uh, is charcoal, right, that's uh, uh, produced from biomass, right, and it's subjected to a process called uh, pyrolysis. So you superheat uh, the, uh, the biomass uh, in a low or no oxygen environment, and it creates a charcoal. Okay? And that charcoal, in turn, can be spread on crops, right? And ultimately, will hold carbon dioxide and will promote 
the uptake of carbon dioxide in those soils, right, and, and, and potentially store biomass for hundreds of years as opposed to far more ephemeral releases if, if the biomass was, was utilized in other ways, okay? That's the biochar uh, process, okay? Um, a lot of people tout biochar because of the co-benefits uh, that, uh, that, that we talked a little bit about before. Um, under some circumstances, biochar likely would increase soil water retention, right? That can be terribly positive. It can also increase crop yields. It can also reduce the bioavailability of toxic heavy metals in, in, in soils, okay? So the co-benefits, again, could help drive uh, the market for this and, and produce those potential benefits. On the other hand, there's a number of challenges associated with biochar, okay? First of all, uh, is, uh, is there's all kinds of estimates of, of, of what the potential are, and it's based on all kinds of different assumptions. Some studies say that realistically, uh, the, the, the largest scale biochar operations could reduce the amount of atmospheric CO2 by about 0 0.9 uh, gigatons, right? So less than a, a gig a year. Some studies put it as high as nine, okay? Uh, that kind of characterization remains speculative at this point. It's based on all kinds of assumptions and methodologies that often don't agree. And so we clearly don't know at this point what, what, what the real potential is uh, in terms of, of biochar, okay? Um, another problem is that while we could get some of the biomass feedstocks that we would need to pre produce biochar from, from waste materials, such as forest residues, for example, or municipal waste, uh, it's likely that a very large scale, uh, we would require large amounts of land to grow the biomass for the biochar, right? Large amounts of forest, for example. One recent study said that to produce biochar at the upper levels of sequestration that we're talking about could require as much as 3.9 million square miles of land, okay? So um, how much land is required, what we're using for the feedstocks will make a big difference uh, in, in, terms of, uh, in terms of what happens. Another thing is, is that we need to spend a lot more research money on characterization of biochar because it becomes very tricky uh, it, on every axis. Remember he said that biochar could have potential co-benefits, right? It could increase crop production in some areas. But there's some studies that say that in some areas with certain kinds of soil or certain kinds of climates that the application of biochar could actually result in a net decrease in crop production, right? So that kind of characterization has to happen. There's studies also that say that biochar in, uh, it applied in certain areas under certain climatic conditions in certain soils actually results in a net decline also of two other potent greenhouse gases, methane and nitrous oxides. Then there's some other studies that say uh, that under different conditions, you can see a net increase in, uh, in methane and nitrous oxide production that could offset all of the benefits that you get in terms of biochar, right? So we need a lot more research in this context. Unfortunately, the research is extremely expensive uh, and if there isn't a cost of carbon that helps drive right, that kind of research, um, it's hard to know uh, how, we're, uh, how we're going to get to that, okay? Um, and so um, uh, at this point, we have a very modest uh, amount of money being spent in terms of biochar uh, uh, research and unclear uh, when this will change. Okay, one more before we talk about uh, uh, governance. And this is called um, enhanced mineral weathering. Okay, or, or EMW, okay? So um, there's a natural process uh, that, that we have that's called uh, uh, chemical uh, uh, or mineral weathering, okay? And it continuously erodes away or weathers rocks uh, in our landscapes. And this, in, if you look at a carbon cycle, ultimately takes up virtually all of the CO2 in the atmosphere at some point, okay? But the key is uh, in the course of the carbon cycle, Okay. This is a very slow process. This mineral, natural uh, weathering process sequesters carbon uh, at, on timescales of millions of years. Okay. Proponents of this approach uh, uh, argue, though, uh, that accelerating it would have substantial benefits. Okay. So the natural process works this way. Okay. So the process begins with rain. 
right? The rain takes up uh, carbon dioxide, which is, uh, uh, and, and makes the rain slightly acidic, uh, having absorbed that carbon dioxide in the journey. The acidic rain uh, then reacts with rocks, okay? And, uh, and it starts to gradually break down uh, those, those rocks, okay, into minute rock grains, okay? Um, it also, in that process, forms bicarbonate. And in that bicarbonate process, the CO2 is taken up, okay? And when that CO2 is uh, converted in that bicarbonate process, it can then be stored in that form for hundreds and hundreds of years, ultimately washing off into the world's oceans, for example, okay? That's the natural process. Proponents of enhanced mineral weathering argue that we could accelerate this process by taking large amounts of certain kinds of rocks that, that are uh, fundamental to this process, things such as olivine, right, um, and, and, and other kinds of silicates, and grind them up finely and spread them either in the world, on the world's uh, land masses, in coastal areas where, where uh, wave forces would also break down the rocks or spread them directly, these particles, uh, in the world's oceans. And by accelerating the process, they say we could take up substantial more carbon dioxide and take it up much more uh, uh, quickly, okay? So, what do the studies tell us about uh, enhanced mineral weathering? As is true with a lot of these other things, they're all over the board here, right? Some of them say very small amounts or relatively small amounts of CO2 can be taken up by accelerating this process, maybe a, a gigaton a year of CO2. Some say maybe somewhere between 4.5 and 5 gigatons, right, which would get us about 25% uh, uh, of the way to where we need to be, right, in terms of these carbon dioxide removal processes. But again, uh, we're, not, uh, we're not certain, okay? Also, large challenges and risks associated with this process, as you can probably imagine, okay? One major challenge uh, is that the mining process itself uh, would require about 10 to 30 percent of the energy uh, benefits that you would be getting from this process and the CO2 production, right? So again, uh, you have a large penalty, right, associated with, uh, with the mining process itself. Second of all, the mining process, of course, is going to have environmental benefit, uh, disbenefits in themselves, okay? And uh, the mining process is also going to produce fine particulates uh, and those need to be assessed in terms of their potential health impacts, right? So we all know this, the, the finer the particulates become, the more hazardous they can be in terms of lodging the lungs and, and not being removed very quickly. And so this process would require lots of production of fine particulates, right? So there's potential health implications. Cost could be very high. Some studies say as much as $450 per ton, right? At that cost, it's not going to happen. Others argue that it could be brought down to somewhere around $50 per ton, but we don't know, right? And the last thing is, is that we have not adequately characterized the biogeochemical impacts in the world's oceans, right? Of substantially increasing uh, the, 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 in, the intake of these uh, chemicals. On one hand, some proponents argue that this could be highly beneficial in addressing another threat associated with CO2, which is ocean acidification. Right? By increasing alkalinity in the world's oceans, by introducing all these bicarbonates, it could actually reduce the threat of ocean uh, acidification. On the other hand, um, and massively and quickly accelerating alkalinity in the world's oceans could have catastrophic impacts for a lot of species. And we simply don't know at this point, um, and that would require research, um, and we don't know at what scale that research really needs to be done to, to get and yield the kind of results that we need to be confident that we could do this on a large scale, okay? Okay, so we've talked about a number of these options, okay? All, again, as I, as I emphasizing at, at an at a infant scale in, in most cases, but all increasingly being acknowledged as part of the solution if we're going to get to, to where we need to be in terms of Paris. So the question then becomes, um, how would we regulate uh, these options, and how have we regulated these options to date, right? Because we already know these options have potential risks, potential benefits, and in some cases have potential transboundary uh, implications, right? So first of all, let's talk about the international treaty regimes uh, that have actually sought to regulate these, uh, these technologies to date, 
okay? And at this point, there's been, there's been two of them, okay? Um, the first of these um, is, uh, is a treaty that we call the Convention on Biological Diversity, right? This is a treaty that virtually every country in the world belongs to, um, uh, except us, of course, but everybody else is pretty much in the Convention on Biological Diversity. Um, the CBD began to be uh, concerned about uh, these options when oceanary fertilization experiments began uh, in 2007, 2008, right? And the CBD, uh, as you can see from some of this language, uh, ultimately classified these things as geoengineering, okay? People sometimes say that carbon dioxide removal is not geoengineering, some say it is. Whatever the case, CBD said it's geoengineering and they passed a resolution to regulate this kind of research, right? The uh, seeding of small patches of the world's oceans with uh, iron. Because one of the things that, that was being talked about at the time, there were a number of companies working on this. There was one in San Francisco called Planktos. Uh, and what Planktos was saying is, we'll, we'll experiment a little bit with this, and then we'll start putting large amounts of iron in the ocean, calculate how much CO2 is being taken up, and then we'll sell those credits on the voluntary carbon market, or maybe ultimately under the Kyoto Protocol. Okay? So the CBD became concerned about oceanary fertilization and its potential impacts on biodiversity. So they passed a resolution in, in 2010. Okay? And what the resolution said essentially was, first of all, you can only utilize, uh, only experiment with ocean iron fertilization at a small scale, okay? Didn't define that term, but said it had to be small scale research. Second of all, it could not be for commercial purposes, so you couldn't be doing it to sell credits, okay? And third of all, it had to be subject to a risk assessment of a protocol of some sort, okay? So you had to establish something that looked at the risks and benefits and characterize those risks and benefits, okay? Um, and that's what the CBD said, okay? A number of limitations in terms of, of, of this approach, though. One is these resolutions that are passed the, the, when the parties meet, they meet every couple of years under the CBD, the resolutions that they pass are not legally binding on the parties to the treaty, okay? Only the language of the treaty is, is, is binding or amendments to the treaty, okay? But countries tend to follow what happens with resolutions, but it's important to know they don't have to, okay? Um, second problem is the CBD hasn't been a particularly effective regime in any context, right? Hasn't been particularly good at arresting the decline of biodiversity. It's hard to believe that it's gonna take this very esoteric issue and really be able to do it effectively, okay? Um, third problem uh, is that um, it, it, because it's a convention that focuses on biodiversity impacts, uh, it doesn't necessarily tell us anything about uh, other impacts associated with these processes, including impacts on humans, right? Simply not the focus of, of, of this regime, okay? Okay, so that's the CBD. A second uh, regime uh, started looking at these issues also called the London Dumping Convention. Okay. So this is a treaty that was established in the 70s uh, to address dumping of materials in the oceans, right? As we remember when we had things like uh, Times Beach and Love Canal and all those things where we had toxic impacts on land, uh, we being human beings, uh, we could have said, well, we've got to reduce those toxics in some ways, or we could find another place to dump them, right? And so our idea was plan B. Right? So there was a substantial increase in dumping of toxic materials in the oceans. And so we established this treaty uh, to try to address uh, those potential threats. So the London Dumping Convention became concerned because all of a sudden people were depositing iron in the ocean. Right? They said, uh, we, we should have something to say about that. Okay? So they passed a resolution. First thing they said was, this isn't dumping. Okay? They said dumping is when you throw materials in the ocean for disposal. Okay? It's not if you're doing it for other purposes. And this isn't for disposal, it's to create, you know, to address climate change. Okay? So that would seem to be good news for those that wanted to do the experiments. The bad news is, is they put a number of restrictions that were just like the CBD's uh, uh, resolution. First of all, it can only be done on a small scale. Second of all, it can only be done for experimental purposes, currently at least, right? Um, and third of all, a, a risk assessment. And they actually established this assessment framework, right, which uh, creates, you know, the kind of things you've seen in any kind of standard 
risk assessment, uh, including a, a management process, okay? So the London Dumping Convention. Now, uh, there's a number of limitations associated with this convention also. First of all, again, its resolutions are not legally binding, okay? So parties may obey what they say, they may not obey uh, what they say, okay? Second of all, um, there's a limited number of parties to the London Dumping Convention, right? You're talking about 70 or 80 countries, so if you're flagged in a country that's not part of the London Dumping Convention, you could be engaged in these operations without being subject to the treaty. Yeah? Um, what is the form the iron is in when, they, when they're fertilizing? Yeah, it's, it's a ferrous sulfate powder. It's a powder. Yeah, it's a powder, and extremely uh, in, in extremely powderized form, right? Because the idea is the bioavailability increases the, the finer the, the, the powder is. Okay. And I think commercially it's made as a, a pigment. Yeah. Yeah, so it, it's uh, incredibly fine, just uh, goes in the ocean. Yeah, it's the good news and the bad news. <laughs> well, yeah. so, was this an attempt to say you couldn't do it on the high seas or you couldn't do it in the EEZs or you couldn't do it anywhere? Anywhere. Right. So, or you, you, you could do it. You can do the, you can do the research as long as, as long as there is a uh, risk assessment process, and you're not trying to make money from it, right? And it didn't say forever. It didn't say. It said at this point there's inadequate uh, scientific evidence to justify, um, you know, commercial application of these things or large scale. Uh, use of these things, but it means that in the future, if they thought these characterizations were adequate and they showed low risk, they might potentially sign off on it. Yeah. How often do they meet and change? Oh uh, yeah. Well, they, the uh, the London Dumping Convention meets every year. Okay. Uh, these these the, the parties to treaty come together every year. They pass resolutions. Um, they could change. Uh, they can change anything they want, um, even in the interim. But certainly every year, in the past, new resolution. Okay. So limits to this, right? One is the regulations aren't uh, binding. Um, second of all, uh, the focus here again is on ocean-based geoengineering processes, right? So certainly things, maybe even advanced mineral weathering, where it would wash off into the oceans, uh, you could make an argument, but probably not. Okay. Um, uh, certainly not uh, uh, bioenergy with carbon capture, uh, the, the direct air capture, etc., uh, are not going to apply in this case, right? So this regime has a pretty limited remit uh, in terms of uh, in terms of the things that it could, only, it could regulate. The other thing is is that it's currently uh, expressly only focused on ocean iron fertilization, right? So even any other ocean process that might introduce substances into the ocean couldn't be regulated, okay? Now, on the other hand, um, there is a protocol to the London Dumping Convention called the London Protocol. Uh, and this is, uh, uh, this is a, an updated treaty uh, that it's contemplated will eventually supplant the London Dumping Convention. It's a more sophisticated version of that much older treaty, okay? And one of the things that the protocol did is it passed a resolution a couple years ago to amend the treaty to regulate ocean geoengineering for the first time, okay? Now, amendments to the treaty are legally binding on the parties to the treaty, so you have to do that, okay? So that's the good news, is that they're, they're, it, it tightens the noose in some ways in terms of the, the, uh, the legal mandates that would be established, okay? The bad news, beyond the fact, again, that this still uh, is a limited subset of the things that you can regulate, um, is that uh, this, pre, uh, this amendment has to be agreed to by, uh, by three quarters of the, of the countries that are part of the protocol, uh, which is roughly 45 uh, countries. So far, only one of them has agreed to this amendment, right? So there's a long way to go, okay? Maybe more, right? But it's a, it's a long way to go, okay? So in the longer term, uh, I would argue that the most logical place for this to be regulated, right, any of these techniques, is the Paris Agreement, right? We come full circle back to the beginning, right? The Paris Agreement, in my mind, makes the most sense to be the focus for research, uh, for research uh, regulation and deployment regulation for a number of reasons. First of all, um, these things all seek to address climate change, right? So we, we, by God, we should probably put them in a regime whose focus is, is climate change, right? And that would be Paris. Second of all, 
if we were to deploy these technologies, we're going to be doing them in a portfolio of responses to climate change, right? We're like, we're going to need to mitigate in the traditional way, where hopefully, right? We're going to try to move as quickly as we can to renewables, decarbonize the economy, energy efficiency, et cetera. Second leg of the stool is going to be adaptation, right? Living with the impacts of climate change that we can't avoid, given what we've done, right? And the third, arguably, are, are these geoengineering responses, right? And so the scale of each one of those and how, quick, and, how, and, and how quickly we deploy them and how long we have to deploy them are contingent on the levels and scale of the other responses, right? So we co have to coordinate these responses. So if you're going to do that, then you want a regime that can coordinate and regulate all of those responses, right? And the only one that can do that is Paris, right? London can't do that. CBD can't do that. Uh, nobody else. So Paris, Paris, in my mind, makes sense, okay? Now, the, the first question uh, that, that one has to ask as a lawyer uh, is, does the Paris Agreement have jurisdiction? over carbon dioxide removal options? Could it actually regulate these things? And could they be a way that the parties could meet their commitments under Paris, the nationally determined contributions, right? So that's the thing you have to work through, okay? So we start off with Article 4 of the Paris Agreement, right? Um, and it talks about these NDCs, right? These pledges that countries make to reduce, uh, to, uh, uh, to address climate change, right? And if you look at Article 4, it says that in, in, uh, in making your NDCs, the parties are to pursue, quote, domestic mitigation measures with the aim of achieving the objectives of such contributions, right? So that's how you, your, what your NDCs are. They're domestic mitigation measures, right? So then the question is, would carbon dioxide removal options be a domestic mitigation measure, right? Well, Paris doesn't define the term mitigation strangely enough, despite the fact that it's in there 46 times, okay? So we have to look uh, beyond Paris. Fortunately, uh, Paris expressly talks about its Paris Agreement, right? Incorporates its Paris, uh, uh, Paris Agreement, which is the Framework Convention on Climate Change. Framework Convention on Climate Change does define the term mitigation, right? Article 4 says that you're supposed to take measures on mitigation by quote-unquote limiting anthropogenic emissions of greenhouse gases, Okay, well, that's not what carbon dioxide removal does, right? It doesn't actually reduce your emissions of greenhouse gases, right? So it wouldn't constitute mitigation under that. But the second part is, is protecting and enhancing greenhouse gas sinks and reservoirs, okay? And a sink are things that store carbon dioxide, right? So the argument that, that could be made is to the extent that these uh, measures seek to increase the storage of carbon dioxide, right, in sinks, things like uh, eat phytoplankton, uh, the, world, the bottom of the world's oceans, um, uh, underground, etc., or in rocks. Uh, you are enhancing sinks, and thus carbon dioxide removal approaches constitute a mit mitigation measure. And to the extent that they constitute a mitigation measure, you can incorporate them into your nationally determined contributions, okay? And that's the argument that's being made. Now, one interesting sub-argument uh, for some lawyers is that if you look at the, this language here, it talks about enhancing greenhouse gas sinks, which implies that the sinks exist already, right? So certainly, uh, you'd be enhancing sinks if you were utilizing things such as uh, ocean iron fertilization, right? Or uh, uh, enhanced mineral weathering, where those sinks already exist. But how about backs, right? Are you creating new sinks, right, by, by creating new areas where you're storing carbon dioxide? Is that enhancing a sink? Um, uh, uh, some lawyers say yes, some lawyers say no, okay? So the scope of, of how you could incorporate uh, carbon dioxide removal into your nationally determined contributions um, is, uh, is, is somewhat unclear, okay? Second question is, are there other provisions of Paris that would regulate carbon dioxide removal approaches, whether they're used in your NDCs or not, if you're a party to the Paris Agreement, right? Now, we talked about the fact that these carbon dioxide removal approaches have some potential great benefits, but they also pose some risks, right? Especially at very large scale, 
right? So are there provisions of Paris that would help us potentially to look at those risks, assess those risks, and try to minimize those risks, right? And I think the answer is yes, okay? I just want to, uh, the last thing is, is run through a couple of those before questions. First of all, the preamble to the Paris Agreement, this is the introductory language uh, to the treaty, uh, says that when you take action to address climate change, right, you should quote unquote respect, promote, and consider respective obligations on human rights, okay? Now that isn't the impacts of climate change on human rights, it's the impact of how you respond to climate change on human rights. And so it's terribly pertinent here, right? And the, the argument that I would make is that a number of these carbon dioxide removal approaches at too large a scale have potentially adverse human rights impacts, right? For example, if you deploy BECs at such a scale that it raises food prices by 30 to 40% for the world's poor, you've potentially violated the international human right to food, right? Recognized in a number of individual treaties. If you would divert massive amounts of water as a result of BECs, you potentially violate the international human right to food. Right? And you can look at all of these potential approaches through a human rights uh, lens. Right? You could employ what's called a human rights based uh, assessment process right? the, uh, inside of a risk assessment process to look at those human rights risks. And arguably one of the things that would happen is that we would determine that even if BEX was the cheapest way to get there, right, we might deploy it at a smaller scale because we have to respect human rights, and we might not otherwise do that, right? So this is potentially powerful language for vulnerable people to try to protect their rights if we go down this path. Do you think the word before the underline should be changed instead of should, or must? Well, the problem is, is that, it, well, it must would be nice, but that's not what you got, okay? There's a couple of problems with this language I'll tell you about. One is should, right? Um, uh, the, the, what we call this in the law is precatory language, okay? And that, that means, you know, you can do it, you don't have to do it, right? We should. There's, just, there's an area of, of inconsistency with that one word. Yeah, yeah, but, but that's, that's, that's what happens in diplomacy, yeah. right? And a lot of times people will fight to the death on those individual words, right? Mm -hmm. Paris, in, in general, was like that, right? If you look at the... Uh, language that talks about holding temperatures to hold below two degrees Celsius, it's not mandatory, right? It's not legally binding. And the reason that it's not legally binding is because of one country. You want to guess who that was? <laughs> no, not China. That was us. Um, uh, because if it were mandatory language, it would have created a new legal obligation on the part of the, on the United States, and we would have had to submit it to the Senate for ratification where it would have gone down in flames, okay? Because it's not mandatory, what the Obama administration was able to argue was that it could sign it using what's called an executive order uh, because it only implemented obligations the U.S. already had, right? Under the Framework Convention, we, we've, we pledged to try to hold greenhouse gas emissions to a level below what are dangerous, right? So we said this, is, this does the same thing. But if it was must, we're out, right? Now we may be out anyway, yeah. right? But we've done that before to countries, right? We did, we did that with Kyoto. Kyoto, European countries didn't want any of those market-based mechanisms in Kyoto, right? They said, let's have hard mandates. And the U.S. said, we won't join unless you put the hard mandates in. So the Europeans gave in, and then we didn't join, right? Left them with a flaming bag if you know what to deal with. So uh, this happens all the time. The other problem with this language, beyond being should, is it's in the preamble. And the preambular language to a treaty is not legally binding on the parties unless they've agreed to it, right? So it provides some guidance. It provides some leverage to somebody that wants to argue that you have to consider human rights, but it's not necessarily going to get you there, okay? And that's, that's often what we get with international law, okay? Um, there's also um, uh, uh, provisions that deal with this, this sustainable development, right? That could be helpful also in this context. Article two, so that's binding language, right? Uh, talks about uh, that the treaty needs to be uh, enhanced the implementation of the convention and aims to strengthen uh, the global response to climate change in the context of sustainable development and efforts to eradicate poverty, right? So you could argue that if uh, any of these CDR processes 
undermine sustainable development or at a certain scale would do so, right? That, that they should be regulated in a way to prevent that, right? Conversely, of course, given the potential catastrophic implications of climate change, right, it could be argued that some of these would help us further the principles of sustainable development, right, by, uh, to, by reducing the impacts of climate change, right? So you have to do a comparative sort of process, but at least it pushes us uh, to do that, which is, which is my point. And then finally, the uh, preamble also talks about uh, ensuring the integrity of all ecosystems, including oceans and the protection of biodiversity. So again, this could cut both ways, right? Carbon dioxide removal approaches can help us to protect biodiversity from the impacts of climate change. On the other hand, some of these uh, options at too large a scale could undermine biodiversity, right? So hopefully what it does is it creates a, an assessment framework in which countries look at that and try to craft a portfolio of CDR responses that further the goals of protecting biodiversity in the oceans and human rights while not undermining them by being done at too large a scale or any of them at individual scale, right? And so um, the, the role of, of the international lawyers um, is, to, is to try to ensure that that process happens once CDR is introduced into the debate in, in the context of the Paris Agreement, and it's coming. Um, there's been a number of countries that have started discussing uh, carbon dioxide removal as a potentially a part of their, C, uh, their NDCs in the longer term, including Germany and Switzerland. Um, and there's a number of countries that have already incorporated uh, some of the natural solutions, in, enhanced soil, uh, sequestration of carbon, afforestation, for example. And so this process is, is arguably going to play itself out. Okay, so I'll stop there uh, for questions and just say that in my mind, especially those of you that are young people, um, this is likely uh, to be uh, one of the front and center issues that, that's, that's going to be discussed over the course of the next couple of decades. And as was true with a lot of responses to climate change, it's one that potentially uh, could provide uh, lots of benefits of addressing climate change and at the same time could present some substantial risks. Thank you. Yeah. Which country is leading? Because to me, it looks like the, the, the safest method to go forward, even though you have objections. There will be objections. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, which country is leading right now? Yeah. Nobody is, nobody is leading at this point, I have to say. It's still being done at small scale, but, uh, but like I said, the difference is, is that all of a sudden, in the last two weeks, all of a sudden we went from, I would have estimated probably about $10 million in funding and capital for these projects to about $170 million, right? In two weeks, right? Um, people like People like Bill Gates and Richard Branson, for better or worse maybe, um, are, are engaged in this. And now you have some large capital holding companies that are starting to look at this, okay? Um, now, one of the things that some people find unpalatable, but we may have to live with this, is in my mind, in the longer term, if direct air capture works, the companies that are probably going to control it are going to be people like British Petroleum and Exxon um, and Shell who are also looking at direct air capture because they've got lots of experience with characterizing carbon and storage and things like that. And so some of the people that created the problem are also going to make lots of money in cleaning up the problem, right? <laughs> but, you know, we may have to do that. So U.S. has, US has a, a fair amount of research in this context. As I said, there's a Canadian company. There's a Swiss company. Um, in the longer term, if those companies are able to come in at cost, my guess is that the very large companies like, like Exxon, as they move from, a, from a, an oil-based uh, model, uh, will move to a direct air capture model, and, and they'll be the companies that are involved. And so wherever you deem them to be incorporated or controlled, that's, that's what will have a big part of the market. Thank you. As regards the various methods of carbon sequestration, that can be classified as geoengineering. Many people might have ethical problems with the ability to artificially turn down the planet's thermostat. Yeah. What do you have to say about that? Yeah. Well, a couple of things. Um, 
first of all, we we control the, the Earth's thermostat right now, right? We, we've already engaged in massive geoengineering. We call it fossil fuel production, right, and use, right? So we already do. Um, uh, it, right, we call this era the Anthropocene for a reason, right? Humans, for the first time ever, have been able to profoundly control um, uh, the, the, the levers of, of the world's climate, biodiversity, etc. Yeah. To the extent that we're engaging in it already, I'm not sure that it's any more of an ethical leap now to be trying to engage in a way to, to control it and reverse what we've already done. Okay. Um, having said that, right, um, I think that the, the kind of options that make me more skittish, there's a spectrum of them, are any kind of geoengineering option that has impacts on the global commons or has um, uh, transboundary implications. Because in those cases, any principles of democracy start to break down, right? If you're a country and you're engaged in uh, enhanced mineral weathering and the impacts are all in your country, even if there's some negative impacts, if you're a democratic country at least, you're, the, the citizens can say, we want to do that or not do it, right? On the other hand, when you get to something like Bex, right, where if you massively increase food prices by, by, taking, by, uh, by diverting food crops, uh, you may be having impacts all over the world. Or if you're engaged in some of these processes that introduce substances in the world's oceans, you're having impacts far beyond that. Um, and arguably, uh, it, it has, it, it's far more of an ethical challenge, right? And so, again, you know, some people classify this, this stuff as geoengineering, CDR, and some say the only thing that's uh, geoengineering are solar radiation management approaches, putting sulfur in the atmosphere to divert sunlight away. I don't care, actually. I, I, don't, I, don't, I, I, I don't use the G word because I think the G word can save some of these processes. I've heard people say, oh, well, this isn't geoengineering, so it's benign. It's not like throwing sulfur in the atmosphere, right? And we've talked about these things. They, got some, they have some great risks, right? On the other hand, I don't want people to say, oh, well, it's the same as putting sulfur in the atmosphere and affecting a whole global commons if all you're doing, for example, are planting some trees in your country, right? So I prefer to just call them all intervention processes and that I think we should characterize each one of them in terms of the risks and benefits and decide if we should do them. Yeah. Back in the mid 2000s, there was this you know, huge debate over is climate change happening or not, blah, 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 blah. We got the Stern report, which made it very clear what's really happening. Yeah. You've sketched out a series of removal mechanisms here where there's great uncertainty um, about each of them. Uh, we have to pick the, the best of the bad options. Is there a move afoot for something like a Stern Report 2 that would assess the viability of the options and help guide policymakers to picking the right portfolio? Yeah, we're doing some of that. There's been a, uh, in 2009, the, the, the Royal Society for Science in, in the UK did the first study on geoengineering. And and they define geoengineering as, as CDR and uh, carbon dioxide removal and these solar radiation management approaches. They said those are the two genres, and then let's look at the each one of these options and the risks and benefits, right? But fairly rudimentary, um, uh, and, and, and not a lot of experiments had, had occurred at the time. More recently, the National Academy of Science in the United States um, uh, did two very large studies a couple of years ago of uh, one study on SRM, one study on CDR, um, both funded by the CIA, incidentally. Um, yeah, true story. Um, and then last year uh, did a, another study just on carbon dioxide removal again. Okay. Um, uh, the, the Europeans uh, are, are also, uh, the European uh, uh, Union is also talking about another very large study to try to do these characterizations. Um, and so there will be some research to guide policymakers, but it's still, uh, again, going to be granular enough that, uh, that it's going to be hard for policymakers to totally know what they should do, right? Again, because we haven't deployed what, many of these things. Um, it's very hard for us to assess what they would do at, at scale, right? Especially things like enhanced mineral weathering, right? 
What, what, what's the biogeochemical impacts at a very large scale with these things? Sometimes we look at paleoclimactic data. We try to look at what the climate looked like 400 million years ago with similar conditions and things like that. But conditions aren't similar, right? And so, um, and you're using proxy data that, that's not necessarily that accurate. It's just very difficult uh, in a lot of cases. Some of them, in the end, are probably still going to require either a leap of faith or we're going to have to say we're going to be incredibly risk averse and just try to use some of these that we've got some grand experience with like afforestation, soil carbon enhancement, etc. Uh, that do seem pretty benign, but of course may not get us to where we need to be, right? Again, you know, well, the frustrating thing in some ways is, is, is if, if the, our collective world had half a brain, we would never be in this situation, right? And, and the only role for CDR would be uh, at very modest scales, right, to help to mop up things like cement production and things like that where we can't really utilize renewables, right? But renewables would have had such a large market penetration uh, that we would never be saying, oh my God, we got to suck 20 billion tons of CO2 out of the world to save ourselves, right? It's, it's absurd. Uh, but when you create that kind of environment, then you create both high risks of doing nothing and high risks of doing something. I'm just going to kind of pose a hypothetical here. What happens when, say, some uh, entrepreneurs take some of these natural processes out of the usual context? I like that to go around. I mean, I'm envisioning a possibility, for instance, with ocean fertilization where it might be done in an aquaculture environment, and you still have an impact potentially but it's not its normal spot. Yeah. Well, if you're doing it if you're doing it in, in purely coastal areas, right, inside of exclusive economic zones, then you have a treaty like the Law of the Sea Convention, right, that talks about what the obligations of coastal states are for research that's conducted within their exclusive economic zones, which are anywhere within two hundred miles, right, of, of coast, right? And Th there's admonitions about what they have to do, right, in terms of coastal impacts not affecting areas beyond that, et cetera. But that largely would be regulated by those coastal uh, uh, states. Yeah. So just a comment, a thought, which is on the uh, soil uh, sequestration side, um, you know, there's a whole other entry point here, which is the sustainable agriculture yeah. entry point that you can increase carbon uptake through crop, uh, cover crops and crop rotation where you don't have to experiment with big additions. And, you know, given how much soil we're losing and the extraordinary co-benefits of, you know, so there are perhaps other avenues into increasing soil sinks on the planet that haven't yet come into the conversation and that be might become very important in the Paris context especially for agricultural nations. Yeah, it absolutely is. It, the question is how, how, again, as is true with most of these, is how large a scale, right? How, um, and how fast. And how fast. Yeah. Um, there's a professor at Berkeley who just did an article in Nature last week uh, talking about this very issue named oh. Bel Beldaccio, yeah. right? And he was extremely skeptical, right? He, he said based on the areas that he thought it could be done at any kind of scale, and, and the, the speed that it could be done that we're looking at at 0.5 to 0.7 gigs a year from soil, right? So, you know, but he, did, he, doesn't, he doesn't think it's a silver bullet, right? So that, that's okay. Yeah, there's no silver. Right, there's no silver bullet, it's silver buckshot, and, right? And but, that's, but on, and that's one the, of the cost, the cost risk, uh, you have a low risk. You have a low risk with that, right? Have a right. Low, there's, lower benefit yeah. There's almost benefit. no there's almost no downside uh, to doing that unless there's an opportunity cost of spending too much on it that you could be using for something else. That's one of the arguments that he's made. He said that if you're going to uh, uh, focus uh, costs and look at these kind of things, you'd be, make more sense to be looking at concentrated solar, for example, than you would be with soil enhancement. Right. Well, except that you're also growing food and creating biodiversity. Yeah, I mean, the, right. But he does a whole, <laughs> look at what he says, he does a whole cost-benefit analysis and still thinks that there's an opportunity cost that doesn't justify it. There are plenty of people that would say he's wrong, right? right? Uh, but it's not, it's, it's, not, it's not totally clear, right, how much we get from it. But it, it's certainly one of the things that we should be looking at, yeah. right? Because there's co-benefits, 
you get political support by doing that. Uh, that's, that's, right. that's beneficial, right? And, and we don't we don't risk the destruction of the planet through this. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, right. But, uh, you know, the proponents will say if it's too small, then we should have been thinking bigger in terms of these options because inevitably we're going to pass these thresholds, right? But they're most uh, uh, those kind of things, for the most part, are, are they're not mutually exclusive from the other things we could do, right? Some of the others are a little more mutually exclusive. We didn't talk about this. It. interesting. There's trade-offs. Like, for example, if you decide you want to do biochar, at very large scale, you're probably going to need a lot of trees, and that means you're going to be able to do less with afforestation or with backs, right? Or if you're going to do backs at a large scale, it's going to cut down the feedstock that you'd have for biochar or, or some of these other things, right? And so some of them have trade offs. Soil carbon, largely, largely one no, right? There's, there's almost no, no real good argument other than maybe opportunity costs, and I'm not certain about that one either. I have one question. I don't know whether it's relevant or not. <clears throat> because every time we talk about any solution, we are thinking about a large scale. And the large scale solution has been really damaging to the world. Whether you are building, uh, planting large scale or coffee plantation or palm oil, whatever. Yep. Now, even large scale solar, solar could be harmful. Why do we not ever think about small scale? Let every house build a tree, plant a tree, or do something. Mm -hmm. Maybe that would be a, 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 if we wouldn't need that long stretch of the research. We know some of the things are effective. Why don't we do small scale? Yeah. The, the answer at this point may be, we, the, the bad news may be we probably have to do both at this point, right? We're, we're so close to expending the, the carbon budget that gets us to two degrees Celsius, right? 1.5 we've probably already blown past realistically, right? So small scale sort of individual interventions probably aren't gonna be enough. Um, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't be doing those simultaneously, right? And the benefits too of talking about small scale interventions in my mind is you build norms toward a commitment to addressing climate change and that can translate into people caring more about climate change and telling politicians that we will vote you out if you don't deal with climate change right so that there's there's co-benefits right to deep individual approaches beyond what the impacts they have but arguably we have to do this and you know i'm uncomfortable with it too again it, it, what it means is we got ourselves into this terrible place through irresponsible uses of technology, and now we're talking about large-scale uses of technology to get us out of that mess, right? But it's certainly not the first time we've done that, right? So, yeah. If you're not squeamish about that, there's something wrong with you, in my mind. <laughs> I kind of, I'm still kind of formulating a comment. I don't know if it's a question. And it, it's in terms of food security and monocultures. And, um, I guess I'm, just, I'm thinking about Cuba and like their, after this, the fall of the Soviet Union, how their agricultural system was dependent on monocultures and completely dependent on fertilizers. And it, the recommendation for monocultures, um, it, it just seems to me is sort of, um, violation to food, uh, human rights and food security because it makes agriculture so dependent. Um, again, it, it, it makes, it degrades the soil to a certain extent where you can't grow without highly chemical like use. Um, so I just wanted, was wondering if there, has anybody thought of this? Like in, can we learn from a country like Hua where they were forced to adopt organic practices and they might not be necessarily up to par in terms of food security um, and providing for their for their people, but um, I think it's a it's a great if they were under different circumstances, it'd be a great model. Yeah, I, I think we certainly need to be to be looking at that. Whether we will or not, it's a different question. One of the reasons that they focus often on monocultural force when it comes to uh, to this kind of stuff 
is uh, those kind of trees, eucalyptus, huge monocultural eucalyptus forests, take up carbon really fast, right? And so a lot of it's being market driven by getting carbon credits as quickly as you can, right? Even if it has biodiversity impacts. So you have to try to build those safeguards in, right? Um, and you've got to be careful in every context. Again, we were talking about there being no free lunch. When we talk about soil carbon sequestration, right? Not biochar, but trying to enhance this soil's uptake. One of the things that people talk about a lot is no-till, right? Mm -hmm. right? We, um, problem with no-till is you often have to increase uh, the, the amount of uh, herbicides and pesticides that you're using to get the same yield, right? So you, in a life cycle assessment, you now have to figure out what that means in terms of your uh, net balance benefits or not, right? So uh, nothing we do doesn't, doesn't have to take those things into consideration, and all the things you're talking about should be fed into that model. Doesn't mean they will be. Right. right. Uh, 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 a lot of this ultimately will probably be driven by by the private sector if, it, if it's done at scale. Right? And so then it's going to be the responsibility of the public sector to try to mandate these safeguards. Right. But you have the same sort of political process that you've always had. Okay. Just I want to answer that question also. Like a great uh, model to follow is from Australia. Mm -hmm. They are the best in zero tillage. They yeah. started that from uh, 1940. And I believe it's really great for us to switch uh, from monoculture to zero tillage. Because monoculture has a lot, lot of trouble. Yeah. Do, do you have any interest uh, doing more research about uh, zero tillage to yeah. reduce? Because I noticed there's really few article published, and there's a lot of mess, and uh, people not clear about this issue. Yeah, it, it, it absolutely is. It's one of those areas, there's there's a lot of studies on zero or, or low-till agriculture, and in my mind, there's still a lot of question in terms of not only the life cycle questions, but the actual sequestration benefits. For example, some of them say that they look only, they look only at, at, at top layers, and they see pretty substantial sequestration, and they say, okay, well, we're getting big benefits. Turns out in some of the lower layers, you're getting more releases, right? So on balance, you don't necessarily get the kind of benefits you think. Other studies have found very different things, right? So there's still methodological considerations of this and clashes of assumptions uh, that need to be resolved, right? Beyond the questions of whether farmers will adopt them, what the costs are, et cetera. But the, the science is still largely, in my opinion, uh, unresolved. Other questions or comments or reflections or oh yeah, yo yes or <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm I'm a, I'm a little older than you guys. I remember when nuclear power was gonna solve all our problems with <laughs> you know. And it did. Oh it did. <laughs> so you know, I, I, I thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And for those of you who um, still have any brain cells left, we have another talk this evening with um, David Roberts.